Fast forward to the summer of 1981. You're staying in Chelsea, New York. I was staying with my friend Karen Durban who at the time was an editor at The Village Voice. If you care to Google Karen Durbin today, you'll see Karen is a noted film critic. And she had a, an apartment in Chelsea and was kind enough to let me sleep on her sofa from time to time. And Karen had two cats, Fripp and Eno. <laughs> and Fripp and Eno were frisky young boys. And when the light came up, they would begin to play. And on one morning, at about five past eight in the morning, they both ran over my head. And I woke up and... I saw how it was that music comes into our lives. Instantaneously, in a flash. And... What I saw was that music never goes away. What goes away is the musician. Music continues, the musician does not. And this changed the focus of my practice and discipline as a musician, which was to hold myself as present as I may. If I am present, I know music is not going away, so there is a greater opportunity that music might lean over and take me into its confidence, knowing that I'm listening. Something like this. And then, as this began to recede, it was as if a door closed on the world where music comes from. And it was like a gentle breeze, and then the door closed. But I just had a glimpse through to where music came from. And then it was about seven minutes past eight in the morning, and it was time to go to the Sandalini Cafe for breakfast. If we fast forward another couple of years, 1983, the Greek theater in Berkeley, magnificent outside outdoor theater because that was the day I started signing autographs on your behalf. Because <laughs> a young lady came up and said, may I have your autograph? And I said, no, but my sister will give you hers. <laughs> so since 1983, I have been signing in many, many different situations, Patricia Fripp's sister to Robert Fripp. And I am always amazed when I do merchandising for King Crimson or any of your, your friends, like the California Guitar Trio, how often your fans want my autograph. <laughs> what is most memorable for me is not so much the concert, as fabulous as it was, or signing your autographs, which has amused me, was the next day you had a press conference. And I walked in and you were surrounded by hairy young men from Berkeley. Did they have spectacles? Yes, there did be spectacled hairy young men from Berkeley, from the local college stations and some of the, the more established radio stations for a press conference. And this young man, one young man said, Mr. Fritt, how did you feel about last night's concert? And you said it was good. And he said, that doesn't sound very enthusiastic. <laughs> and you said... No, this is your story to tell. <laughs> he said, what you don't understand is that we are five and a half weeks into a three-month world tour. And last night, it was a good, honorable concert. We performed well. The fans responded positively. However, what you don't know is once in a while, it's as if... Angels descend from the heavens 
on chariots of fire and blow trumpets of gold into your ear. Baby Blue, I was there. It has happened many times in five and a half weeks. However, last night was not one of them. And do you have any comment whether we are performing music or on a convention stage or a workshop? How we as speakers, what is it that makes the angels come? You're asking me? Yes. You're the speaker. <laughs> well, we all know in our own worlds, we can work honorably and once in a while something happens. Perhaps that is the impossible, but you have a connection with the audience beyond what normally happens. You know you were the right speaker at the right moment with the right message for the right audience. Because after I heard that, five months later, I went on a speaking tour for five and a half weeks. And it was a time that there was one of the many recessions in America. Four weeks in to the five and a half weeks without going home, delivering after dinner speeches for the Ben Franklin Knife and Fork Club, in Tyler, Texas, in a beautiful country club with a somewhat affluent audience. It was an oil community, so for them, they were doing well. And a young woman came up to the desk and said, excuse me, I am, I'm not a member of your group. However, I have driven for two and a half hours hoping that I could hear Patricia speak because I'm a hairdresser. And that night in Tyler, Texas, with this wonderful room and this great audience that was the perfect sign for the room, I was just delivering eye contact with my concluding comments, and I looked at this young woman and tears were streaming down her face. And everyone came up and shook hands and said, that was wonderful, you're the best speaker. And she waited till last. And she came up and she said, now I know why I drove for two and a half hours. Because God wanted me to hear what you had to say. And that night in Tyler, Texas, was worth five and a half weeks without going home and three days before my last performance, I had three car accidents in half a day. We will pick up this tomorrow, what happens at five and a half weeks on a tour. But that night in Tyler, Texas, I knew what you had said. I experienced what you had said to the hairy young man because the angels descend from the heavens on chariots of fire and blow trumpets of gold into our ear. 